Gospel Tangents needs your support. Please consider donating to our website, gospeltangents.com. We'll use your donation to help produce other podcasts and professional documentaries such as this. Welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Bennett. I sat down with Dr. Mark Staker of the LDS Church History Library. Mark is a historian and has written about the first community that accepted the Mormon Church in Kirtland, Ohio. I was surprised to learn that a former slave by the name of Black Pete was one of the leaders of this early Mormon community. Let's listen in on our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm here with Dr. Mark Staker of the Church History Library, and I appreciate you taking some time uh, to talk to us today here. Well, thank you for including me. All right. So, I believe you have a PhD in anthropology, is that correct? It is. I got a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Florida. University of Florida, so go Gators, huh? Yes, <laughs> yes. You were happy with Urban Meyer, the former Ute, and now and then Florida Gator? Uh, he, yeah, he, he's done well for him, so. <laughs> well, great. So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your book, um, The uh, Ohio Revelations. You probably know the name of it better than I uh, Hearken, right. O ye people, there you yeah, go. the historical setting of Joseph Smith's Ohio Revelations. So. Okay, so it's, it's a great book. Um, I started it, I didn't finish it, but one of the things, uh, especially with February being Black History Month, that I was personally really surprised at was as you started out the book, you started talking about a former slave by the name of Black Pete. So I thought that would be a great, great place to start here, especially with Black History Month. So can you tell us a little bit about um, Black Pete? Uh, what, what do we know about his earliest life? Uh, yes, uh, the reason I selected uh, Black Pete to start out with was because he's been ignored as an early member of the church. I thought it would be a good way to kind of build some of those early events around his life, uh, since he played a, a major role, actually, in uh, some of the early events of, in Kirtland and, uh, that had not been uncovered before. and so. Uh, I focus uh, on uh, his childhood. Black Pete is born a slave in uh, Virginia, but the, it's the northern section of Virginia that it becomes part of Pennsylvania as boundaries are adjusted. And so uh, he's, he ends up in uh, Fallowfield, Pennsylvania as a young child. And the reason we know uh, about his mother and his birth is because as they became part of Pennsylvania, they needed to register because Pennsylvania had already established a law uh, manumitting uh, the slaves there over a period of time. And he was just too old by four years uh, to receive manumission as a slave, and so he was bound to be a slave his whole life. Uh, but he was registered uh, with a mother, um, Kino was her name, and uh, her name suggests that she had come from West Africa uh, in uh, the slave, what was called at that time the Slave Coast, and was probably a Muslim uh, background. And so she had raised him in this uh, uh, white community there in, in northern Pennsylvania as a child where he would have grown up uh, working uh, metal for his uh, owners. Uh, there was a, a black smithy in the area that he'd worked in, and he would have become a skilled uh, slave as that. And, uh, uh, being born just too late uh, to receive manumission from slavery was, of course, a tragedy for him, but it ended up working out that he got his freedom a year after uh, the other slaves in Pennsylvania did because uh, his slave owner, John Kerr Jr., left in his will that he was to be freed 10 years after his owner's death. And fortunately, his owner died <laughs> when he wasn't uh, too old, and it uh, then allowed Black Pete, uh, over a period of time, uh, by 1792, to be freed from slavery. And he um, then was taken into the family, a, a, a relative family of his owners, uh, they were Quakers. And Quakers were opposed to slavery, but they weren't opposed to taking advantage of blacks. <laughs> and in this case, uh, that appears to be what happened. Uh, they continued to uh, 
have him work for them. Um, essentially, he was a slave for the family, even though he had been free. Um, we don't know the details about how that worked out, but it is clear from the historic record that as he moved to Pennsylvania with the family and their setting changed, he suddenly changed his attitude and he became difficult for, the, for them to control and to, to make work for them. And um, in the terms of the family, he became ugly. So now, which, are you talking about the Kerr family or is this another family? Uh, well, this is the Kerr family that had um, married I into the Carroll family. It was that Quaker family that I had mentioned that uh, took control of Black Pete and then they brought him out to Ohio and settled in Kirtland, Ohio. Hercules Carroll, one of the members of that family, had property in, in northern uh, Kirtland. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself because uh, Black Pete's there in Kirtland before he uh, gets control of that property. And Black Pete then uh, gains his, we won't say gains his freedom. He had that, but he, he asserts his freedom uh, from the family and he's able to then act on his own. And he becomes involved in a religious community that's developing there in northern Kirtland. Let me, let me back up just one uh, a second there. So, uh, you said he was born just four years too late. When, when was he born? Do you remember? Was it about 1775 or something like that? I, that it right? was, and I don't remember his birth date exactly offhand, but the, okay. yeah. But so I guess so Pennsylvania had a law for emancipating all slaves that were born. Pennsylvania had a law that would manumit all slaves um, in 1791, but uh, the law was uh, became into effect when it was uh, first uh, issued, uh, which would have been in the 1770s, about the time that uh, the Revolutionary War, and it didn't come into effect until um, it, it didn't include those born before that law was established. Okay. So I think in your book you, you weren't sure on the black on his last name. I think you might have said Carol. But I've, I've heard it was Kerr. Uh, well, often slaves accepted uh, were, were forced to accept their owners' names as their own name, and, I, and it is important. You know, why do we call him Black Pete? That sounds a little condescending uh, today. And his owner, uh, John Kerr Jr called him John as well. John or Jack, it says in the... Um, oh, so Pete goes by Jack the, or John as well. Yeah, John's probably his formal name. Jack, uh, slaves were always given diminutive uh, forms of the name, so it's, it's never uh, Peter, it's Pete. It's never John, it's Jack. But John was his name, Jack is what he was called. And then the records suggest, or, as he's sometimes known, Pete. So Pete appears to be the name that he or his mother selected for him. And uh, when he was registered as a child with his mother, uh, she registered him as Peter. Hmm. And so that seems to be the name she preferred. He's only five years old at the time, and so it's probably a name that had come from his mother. Um, Peter would be the formal form, uh, but Peter was the customary uh, usage. Now. Did he take the black upon himself, or did other people call him uh, Black Pete? Uh, we don't know, but it seems to have been a, a name that he was comfortable with and used, and people knew him by, and so he, w he became known as Black Pete. I uh, didn't use a last name, maybe because he didn't really accept the last names of his owners and preferred to not have a last name. Uh, we don't know. Uh, sometimes slaves did that, they selected, you know, they, they used different names than their owners and they kind of um, asserted some independence that way. <coughs> so this is Black Pete um, who comes to Ohio and uh, becomes active in, in that region. Okay, so, so he, he was a slave with, Peter, with John Kerr, Peter Kerr? Um, the Kerr family. The Kerr family. <laughs> so then he's so Kerr, B Mr. Kerr dies. He he associates with some Quakers for a while. Things don't go well with them, and so then what happens? Yeah. So uh, 
John Kerr dies, Mary Kerr then controls him and he moves into the Carroll family. You don't know how that arrangement uh, had, had happened and he comes out to Ohio with the Carroll family. Um, and he then is um, active in the area. He becomes part of what we know of as the, the Morley family. He becomes part of this Reformed Baptist community uh, in northern Kirtland Township, Ohio, where uh, they want to uh, restore original Christianity. And what that means to them is to, they want to create the organization that existed in what they call the primitive church, you know, that you'll have um, a bishop, that you'll have uh, elders and that you'll have deacons and that you will uh, organize yourself in the ways that the original Christian community had organized itself. And what that meant for them as they looked at Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament was that they had all things in common, that they would share their goods with each other, and that the Holy Spirit was involved in their lives, at, at which um, they were had to work out what that actually meant, um, and it came to mean, you know, speaking in tongues and uh, being influenced uh, in physical ways uh, by the Spirit. Well, as they were working this out in their uh, religious community, uh, Black Pete, who'd become part of that community, was looked at as chief among them, as uh, one source indicates, or that he became a prophet among them. And it looks like he drew on his own slave background and the slave religion that was, uh, had developed in America, kind of more hidden un, you know, underground. And so it had, a, it had drawn elements from West Africa and elements from uh, the Christian community that they were part of and this amalgamation of different cultural and spiritual and religious beliefs kind of had developed into a, a slave religious tradition that Black Pete apparently was exposed to. And he drew on that in his involvement with this Morty family. Now, in what ways we don't know other than the, what outsiders saw and commented on, and they're interpreting all of this from their Anglo-white, uh, Western American uh, perspective, and so uh, we are, we aren't able to sort out all of the details, but there are some hints, and these hints really come out later on as he uh, becomes part of the of Mormonism, and how that develops is that as part of this Morty family, uh, Black Pete lives with uh, the Whitneys for a while, a uh, new old. K and Ann Whitney, who have a home uh, in, in Kirtland Village, and he lives on the farm for a while, and ap apparently kind of moves around with different people. As four missionaries come into Kirtland with copies of the Book of Mormon, uh, they meet on the Isaac Morty farm and preach uh, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And they talk about the Church of Christ that has been organized April 6th of 1830 in Fayette, New York, and um, that this Church of Christ that we know today as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, has authority to preach the gospel and to baptize, and, that there are, and also there's the Book of Mormon that has been translated from an ancient record and that they uh, read to these people. Well, they don't have a lot of copies of the Book of Mormon with them, and they're taking most of those to Missouri, and it looks like uh, just a few copies are left behind in, in Kirtland. Black Pete becomes part of this community, and they don't know a lot. As you can imagine, they've only had a few days' interaction with the missionaries. There are a few people that have copies of the Book of Mormon. They don't know a lot about what this Church of Christ is to, to be. You know, what, what are their doctrines? Or what are their practices? Um, largely, they begin, they just continue as um, Reformed Baptists, the Disciples of Christ, as they call themselves. Um, and they continue the same 
organization and the same practices that they had before. But they also turned to the Book of Mormon uh, for information. And they turned to Black Pete, who's a revelator among them, but he also seems to be the closest thing to a Native American as they can find. Now, how do you get from Africa to Native American? Because it's the other. You know, he's culturally different. He looks different and he has a different cultural background. And so when you're trying to figure out how do we live this restored Church of Christ, well, we look to Native Americans because they're the Lamanites. You know, and what do Native Am Americans do? I'm getting a little ahead of myself because this develops over a several month period. Uh, th these Mormon missionaries baptize uh, most of the members of the Morty family. And Black Pete um, participates in all this. He's preaching and helping with baptisms later on. So we have to assume that he's baptized and that he's ordained a priest as well, uh, along with the rest of these in, in individuals, that, you know, the, the men that are, are converted in this community, because uh, nobody actually says uh, those things about him. But he's clearly part of this community, and he's part of, of what's going on. So just want to stop there for a second. So we don't have <coughs> a, a priesthood ordination certificate or anything, but it seems likely that he probably did hold the yeah. priesthood. Yeah, we don't, we don't have a, a smoking gun that says Black Pete was ordained to the priesthood and became a priest. In the does anyone priesthood refer to him as an elder or deacon or anything uh, like no. that? No, no. He's a prophet among them. He's chief among them. So he has some kind of a, a leadership role, but he, uh, there's no a actual ordination certificate that says he was ordained to the priest. So that's interesting that he's a chief among them. Uh, I guess that's kind of an Indian chief kind of a. Well, it, uh, yeah, it could be could be looked at that way. Uh, I've understood it generally as meaning principal he, that he has a lot of authority and influence among them. But it could be also keen off on that Indian idea because. It, Indeed, they do look to uh, him for influence on uh, how, to, how do you behave as, as an Indian. Uh -huh. and so they are uh, running around the hills uh, doing these pantomime scalping things because they know stories about that, you know, the kind of bloody and gory kind of things. But they're also um, jumping up on tree stumps. And this is a new area, so there, there are tree stumps everywhere. You know, they're jumping up on tree stumps and preaching the people kind of out in the dark and they're rolling down hills uh, because the spirit has influenced them and over time they seem to be incorporating some new things as well uh, such as speaking in tongues and what kind of tongues are they speaking in Indian tongues they're speaking in Indian now uh, we don't have any you know, recordings of these early discussions as to what Indian might sound like to them and whether uh, but there are people in their community that had been out west living among Native American communities, including uh, Neil K. Whitney, th the store leader, who had, had been a trader out of Missi Michigan with, uh, with Native Americans there. And they insisted, oh yeah, these are Indian languages. Um, uh, so there, w there was that focus. And later on, uh, it shifts a bit to talking about Adamic languages and they're speaking Adamic, but in this early period it's Indian that they focus on because of that Book of Mormon connection. Now I've heard in this early time period that there were uh, Methodists, I believe, that uh, did a lot of speaking in tongues. Is, is that true or was that more of a Baptist thing? You know, I looked and looked through the source material to find early accounts of speaking in tongues before this happens, even among the Shakers. Uh, because uh, it's a shaker practice as well, the speaking tongues. And I couldn't find anything before uh, Black Pete's introduction of this hmm. uh, in the Mormon community. Now, shakers pick up on it, and within a couple of years in a nearby community, they are practicing speaking in tongues, and they talk about it being a new thing, wow. that they hadn't been doing that before. So is this so. something that you think that Black Pete may have introduced to the Mormons in Kirtland, is speaking in tongues? I fun? believe he did. Oh, wow. I, I mean, it's a circumstantial case. Uh, there's nobody that says that, but uh, as you look at the evidence, 
as to where it comes from and these early attempts to practice it speaking Indian um, that it seems to have come from him uh, it's uh, abolished put out of the community and then it comes back a, a, a couple of years later and we'll get back back to that in a bit because it's rather interesting how that happens but uh, they they do other things Book of Mormon things you know they pantomime going down the river in canoes and basically it's a what do what little information do we know about Indians and uh, what does Black Pete suggest to us about uh, religion and kind of combining that together and that's what they're doing it's f it's just for a short period a couple of months but it really has a dramatic impact on them as a community and also on the surrounding community because they come to think of this this is what Mormons are like so is this based on the idea of the Book of Mormon what the Lamanites are Native Americans and so they're trying to tie current Native American practices to the Book of Mormon yeah yeah okay. exactly wow. they that's well, the Book of Mormon uh, is about these Indians you know anciently and so we're interested in kind of whatever they're doing today um, must be what the Book of Mormon people did earlier and of course it's uh, largely a fantasy in terms of what they're doing today things such as scalping and stuff it's kind of more of the popular mind uh, that ends up kind of in their in their behavior but it's uh, it's not direct observation and it's not good information you know that they've incorporated but it does um, influence outside perceptions of them uh, one intriguing uh, tantalizing detail because uh, people commented on it from outside the community and that is they talk about them practicing free love and what does that mean well what they know about Indians is that they are polygynous, that they that men in Indian communities have more than one wife. And so it appears that that also, there are a number of sources you kind of have to weave together to that suggest that uh, something like that is going on as well within this community, that they're practicing this and that later revelations specifically address this issue at hand. Um, in their community and so that's also something that Black Pete may have been influenced on there's several uh, individuals that later suggest that he's involved in, in all this and they they're, they're outsiders suggesting it in a negative context but uh, it's understandable because of the slave community that his mother came from and that most of his associates came from practiced uh, polygamy of, of some sort in their traditional cultures you know they brought with them from West Africa and so uh, there are some tr intriguing questions there and uh, we don't really have good answers uh, to most of those questions at this point I have to continue to look through the data and see if there's more information that might help shed light on on that but Black Pete's part of this community He's part of um, this religious enthusiasm that develops between the time the missionaries arrive in Kirtland on November 2nd of 1830 and early January of 1831 when the first individuals from New York uh, start arriving with John Whitmer being the first. Oh, because so John Whitmer was one of the missionaries? John Whitmer... Um, Peter Whitmer is one of the first four missionaries that stop briefly and then head on west, but John Whitmer is sent by Joseph Smith to Kirtland to provide leadership to this community. And so he's the first one that comes that actually has experience as a, a, a long-time member, I mean, long six, time, months, six months, <laughs> a six-month <laughs> member of the church. And he, he, he has some copies of the Book of Mormon he brings with him, and so now they're actually getting good information. Uh, he, ha he has also has a manuscript of the Book of Moses uh, that we have today as part of the Pearl of Great Price that he has uh, most of, if not all of that, with him as well. So he has some scriptures, he has instructions, and he can provide some leadership, albeit uh, it w you know a very inexperienced leadership himself. But from that point, uh, the community begins to shift a little bit. And the 
they pull away from religious enthusiasm, uh, which you know the speaking in tongues, the being overpowered by the spirit, rolling around on the floor, and and other kinds of behaviors uh, that they're doing. Uh, but they don't shift away enough from that. When Joseph Smith arrives uh, on February 4th of 1831, it's still very much a part of elements of the community. And then that's when Joseph begins to receive revelations immediately on that subject that acknowledge that the gifts of the Spirit are important, but provides direction on that. I hope you enjoyed part one of our discussion with Dr. Mark Staker. In part two, we'll continue to focus on Black Pete and talk about stories of his life important in the Kirtland era. We'll talk about a black angel that appeared to him and gave him authority to preach among the Mormons. We'll also talk about his attempts to marry in the predominantly white Mormon community of Kirtland. It would be national news, and it did happen occasionally. It ended up in the national papers that some white person married a a black person, uh, but Emma's aunt had done exactly that. Emma Smith? Emma Smith's aunt, 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 aunt the Hale, had married uh, Joseph Wallace, a black man. Oh, I did not um, know that. Uh, nobody did. They kept it quiet. I hope you'll tune in to our next conversation with Dr. Staker. For more information, please subscribe to our website, gospeltangents.com, where you can purchase a transcript of this podcast for just $3. You can also get one on amazon.com. Please subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube to get an updated interviews. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll continue to support us here at GospelTangents.com.